Yeah. yeah. So, like, if we're looking at, say, traditional cross country versus obstacle course racing, obviously you need more upper body since you're going to use it. But I mean, mm -hmm. what? So, what's what's going to be the big difference in terms of prepping for obstacle course racing versus, you know, a cross country race? Yeah. So. I was one of these people, and, and I've seen a lot of similar people do this, is come into the obstacle scene as a runner from a running background. Mm -hmm. And there are some obstacle races that are relatively easy, and you can get away with it entirely and just be a good runner and smash it and come very highly. Um, there's also a number of races where the obstacles are very technical, the, the carries are extremely heavy, um, and some of the yeah, some of the things you have to do are absolutely not something you've ever trained for as a cross-country runner. And I think mm -hmm. probably the one standout component is that runners tend to be quite weak in terms of absolute strength. You know, their relative strength and power might be pretty good, but their absolute strength is usually quite poor. Um, and I think that was certainly something I learned if I go back to my first ever one, um, is is you need to be a lot stronger <laughs> than you think you are. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of lifting involved and there's a lot of specific um, movement. So it's not just about picking weight off the floor. You've then got to move with the weight and it can sometimes be in awkward positions on your shoulder, on your back, in your chest and so on. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that's one of the key things is just being stronger. Um, but one of the other components, and again, as a, as a sole runner coming into it, you would never have even considered training for this but it is improving your grip strength because there's a lot of you know rigs that you have to hang from and so on and, and some of them can be quite complex or prolonged and and, and that so mm -hmm. uh, so actually the other group of people that tend to be quite good at this sport are people that come from either a climbing background or a mm -hmm. boulder background um which is something my wife and i do anyway so there, there was a little bit of a a kind of head start in a way <laughs> Um, so we, we, we already had some grip strength and grip endurance that, that could help us in those events. So, but mm -hmm. these are things that runners don't ever train because they don't need to. So, Right, yeah, just focus on like <laughs> like forward motion or maybe sometimes yeah. turning slightly, but yeah, mostly we're just moving forward. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I mean, what are you, like, what are you using? Are, are you doing traditional lifts? Are you doing like Olympic lifts? Are you picking up logs and running with like, like what does training actually look like for you yeah, or your athletes, I guess. It's quite varied. Um, the people I coach, it depends on their background and it depends on their proficiency and experience. But if they've never done any strength training, then it purely starts with body weight exercises um, to bring their level of strength up and, uh, you know, simple things, push ups, body weight, squats, so on. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually the goal is to move towards lifting weight. Um, and at the, sort of elite end or the more advanced end yeah we'll, we'll be power lifting we'll be olympic lifting um uh, there'll be some sort of circuit type of activities involved in training um but then when you come to specificity the the, the races themselves have these components embedded in the run so there's also training sessions we design where we we have a set of obstacles or a set of exercises that are integrated into an interval session um, you know, what one good example is, you know, that the Spartan race series has burpees as a penalty in their races. So we mm -hmm. have training sessions, which are pretty emotional, <laughs> but um, is where, you know, a set of burpees will be completed immediately before like an 800 meter rep. And then you rest mm -hmm. and you repeat, and, you know, much like a track repeat. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so you're integrating a bit of additional fatigue and some specificity to the race. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. So as I mean, as the sport's developing, you're talking about. I assume things are kind of becoming a little more standardized. Like, are you getting to like standard obstacles, or is it still just whatever mm. the race director wants to do? Yeah, that, it's a brilliant question because um, right at the moment there's a there's a push towards having a little more standardization, and the reason for that is some of the some of the bigger brands in the sport so if we move away from like the governing body of the sport and then we consider the brands which are things like um tough mudder and spartan race and mm -hmm. in the us you have something called rugged maniac and, and companies like this they they're brands so they have their own series some of them have their own world championship events um some of them have their own professional athletes sponsored mm -hmm. paid athletes 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and in those brands, they, they've developed over several years, and there is standardization where you know there will be a certain number of obstacles. The weight of the carries will you'll know what they are, and, and you know what's coming. And there's a little bit of conflict as to whether people like that or not. You know, is it challenging to know what's coming or is it actually useful to know what's coming so you know how to train? Mm -hmm. So but when we go back to the, the governing body and, and rules and regulations, this is this is really juvenile, I suppose, in its development. Um, and this is something that's coming about. Um, and there's been a couple of examples in the last year or so where championship events have had an absurd number of complex obstacles that very few people have been able to complete. Um, mm -hmm. One example I'll give you is last year, the European Obstacle Race Championships. Um, I think in the, this is in the elite field, I think there were eight men that finished the race and one woman, and that was it. So the, it was a little bit redundant. There was a big start line of good athletes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But the race design was so complex that very few people could even finish the race. And, and so that kind of triggered this need for regulation. And, it, it, you know, it'd be a bit like a marathon one day suddenly being 50K, you know. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, oh, yeah, you think you're almost there. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So there, there is a need for some regulation um, and it will come. But it, it's it's early days. So Yeah. I kind of wonder if, you know, you could figure out. I guess I'll say like a range of parameters instead of saying, you know, I mean like, 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 a, like an Olympic distance triathlon, it's, it, it, you know, 1.5 uh, kilometer swim, a 40 K bike, and then a 10 yeah. K run. Like it's a standard distance. There is various courses. So you do get some variety there, but you know that like, this is the distance we're going. Yeah. So I kind of wonder if, you could even do something wider than that with OCR and say, you know, like I, I'm not super familiar with their sport, so I apologize for how ridiculous this will probably sound. So like say, okay, you know, you're going to have like a wall climb and it can be between five and 10 meters yeah. tall. Yeah. And yeah. if, you know, if it's over a certain height, then it has to have a rope or whatever. And then yeah. you like give almost a grading score to each obstacle Yeah. and say like, the obstacle difficulty is one to 10. There's mm -hmm. 10 obstacles. You can have a maximum score for your course of 50 yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So then you know, okay, maybe today the wall is only five meters and then like um, monkey bars are 20 feet long or whatever versus, mm -hmm. and then that score adds up. You follow them? You, you kind of yeah, go. Yeah, no, I think that would be. It's like you can have, you can have parameters for each of them. They can always vary. But then the overall difficulty, it's like this is a difficulty of 50 for this course or a difficulty yeah. of 70. So you have some standardization, but also yeah. keep like the variety and almost like wildness of the sport alive. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the appeal. It is something that's a little bit random and that, that will yeah. appeal to most people in the sport. And part of me feels that if it becomes too standardized, it then becomes a bit like running a marathon where, you know, you know, the start and the finish is the same distance apart. <laughs> there will be drink stations and aid stations. And, and that yeah. doesn't appeal to everybody. And, and so, right. yeah, so, but but I like that grading system uh, approach that I think that could work. But it, I haven't heard discussions of that, um, yeah, in, in the movements towards standards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it, it would but, be, it would, I think it would take a lot of work. So if you're trying to implement that kind of system, mm -hmm. I think it would take a lot of work and a lot of revisions as mm -hmm. people argue the merits of, yeah, you know, I don't think that deserves this kind of scoring. And like, how do you quantify that? And you yeah. may be the, you know, one of the guys to actually figure out how to quantify that with all of your kind of knowledge in both the sport <laughs> and your fields yeah. to figure out like what actually makes sense. But yeah, I, I think it would take a, a lot of work, but it, yeah, I just thought about it in terms of, my perception of obstacle course racing is is that the randomness and chaos is almost the the appeal for most people versus yeah, yeah let's run a 5k yeah i i think you're right that that certainly from having been in the sport and then quite heavily for a few years that i think that is the appeal and one of the one of the upsides to that is it keeps it exciting and then it also attracts more people to come into the sport 
Um, one of the downsides to that, I feel, is that the I know the governing body would like to push towards Olympic bid, actually, to try and okay. embed this as an Olympic sport. And my fear is that the sport from the outside looks messy and it, and it looks random and it, no one's really cl clued up as to what it actually is. <laughs> and if yeah. that is the case, then being an Olympic sport is, a, is an impossible task. So you have to bring in some kind of standardization and some uniformity so people understand what it is. And, and yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I think, you know, there's some good examples of recent sports. Um, climbing is one of them that's an Olympic sport next year in Japan. And they've created almost a new sport to cater for like the Olympic ideal. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of confusing from the climber's point of view, but, it, but it's exciting for the viewer's point of view. So, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, so there are yeah, other challenges to, to overcome. I think you can make the sport entertaining to watch as a viewer. I mean, like, uh, I guess I, I, obviously there's a Japanese version, and then there's the American version of American Ninja Warrior, which is not the same thing. But you know, like, people don't necessarily – they're not standardized courses at all, no. but people yeah. love watching them. Yeah. So yeah. I think you could take OCR and make it definitely watchable – and also mm -hmm. have some kind of, you know, system that people may not necessarily understand right away. But like, mm. if I watch gymnastics or figure skating, I don't yeah. understand the scoring for that right away either. Yeah. But I can still enjoy watching it. So yes. I don't know that I don't know that you necessarily have to make it so like black and white. Like this is my time around a lap on the track. Yeah. But I th I think it could be done and still maintain some yeah. of that some of that randomness yeah yeah i think so and, and as long as it's watchable then yeah, yeah. The non enthusiasts will like to watch it at a chance I'd, I'd say more people would possibly even tune in for ocr versus like a, the 5k i know people that aren't distance runners often have a hard time watching a distance race because they're like like what am i wa they don't understand what they're watching it's just like when i watch yeah. baseball I'm bored out of my mind watching baseball because I don't understand the intricacies of what's happening in the shifting players and all of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can certainly I can certainly attest to that, having been to a baseball game and not knowing the rules. Yeah. <laughs> so it's you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's not well, especially there. There's not a lot of movement. It just mm -hmm. seems like guys are standing around. You're like, well, like what am I watching? Yeah, I'll just I'll just sit in my beer and eat my hot dog. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, so one thing I'm kind of curious about, um, with your like qualifications and stuff is, so you're, you're um, a registered nutritionist mm -hmm. and so I, I have actually have a registered dietitian that works with me, uh, and the company. Yeah. What, what's the difference between the two? Like, how does that come into your coaching? Cause I know you say specifically, like you don't do dietetics or like medical yeah. nutrition therapy. So like. What is that for you? What like in in your kind of coaching or line of work? Yeah, so I mean, the, I guess any practitioner has to work within their remit, and and as soon as you step outside of that, you're you're breaching what you're qualified to do. And, and so, yeah, in the in the US, you have dietetics and nutrition, uh, and there are registered dietitians that can work as say. Um, medically qualified dietitians, perhaps working in hospitals and okay. actually prescribing diets to patients. And, and okay. we, we work closely with some of these actually in Cleveland, where they would help us design our our uh, inpatient diets for patients that we had on studies there. Um, nutritionists uh, is a little bit different, where you, you are not registered to practice as a as a medical dietitian. Um, okay. But you're registered to to provide nutrition advice and so on. And, and so for me, on a, on a sort of daily basis, what that involves is the coaching um, or the clients that I'm coaching. Um, I can advise them on, on ways to optimize, say, their meal exercise timing. Their, if they're leading up to races, I can I can advise on how they might be optimizing their carbohydrate intake or during their race, for example, how they can optimize their feeding. If it's a prolonged event that's, say, longer than 60 minutes, what could mm -hmm. they feed with? What could they um, use to carry the food, which is another <laughs> component of some of these races? Okay. Um, how often should they be eating and so on? So that, that's kind of where my, uh, yeah, my use of that comes in. And, 
Okay, so it's just this is the next stretch. I spent some time trying to figure it out before we were talking because I'll. It really seems like I mean you have the ability to cover a large variety of what people would be interested in if they said, I don't know what to eat or like the best thing to eat or like that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah, you have to stay away from like the medical side of things. Yeah, and you can't prescribe a diet to somebody. Right. And you know, and and actually, I think if you're trying to do everything, there's not really enough time. Right. Uh, to to cater for that, and I think if someone needs a a nutrition coach, then that's something entirely separate where they're, right. where they're trying to change their their lifestyle, maybe alter some of the nutrients that they're, they're uh, ingesting or, or find ways to help themselves either lose weight or maintain weight or if you're strength training to try and gain mass or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this is a little bit, I saw this on your website and this is like, I think a quote from you it says, if it, if it ain't fun, you ain't doing it right. <laughs> um, and like, this is something that I see time and time again, but almost everybody I talk to and I, you know, I'm talking to predominantly very competitive, often endurance athletes. And it seems like yeah. everybody is like, why well, I, I have fun doing it. I like it because I have fun. You know, I, I don't do it because I'm trying to be an Olympian or, or whatever it is. Mm. Um, did, did you come about this philosophy the hard way or did it come more easily to you? Um, I think as a, again, going back to being a kid, I've just always enjoyed moving and always enjoyed being outside and it's never really changed. As soon as the sun shines and I step out the door, I, I feel like that child. And so I think a lot of people could relate to that, that they just enjoy moving, um, particularly people that are training for, for running based events and, and whatever. Um, but I think where that philosophy came from is actually, I suppose, over the last 10 years of starting to, to coach, advise and so on, I have met a number of athletes who are very robotic in their approach and are just trying to achieve like a PB or uh -huh. a position or a podium place. And, you know, and this is not the majority at all, but... But um, but but I never really understood that approach. Is it if it's not fun, then what? Where where's the stimulus coming from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, and and you, you kind of see it. And again, this is very anecdotal, but you kind of see it when people start to lose interest in their own performance. It's often because they're not enjoying what they're doing, and that that can either be that they're, you know, if they're self coached, maybe they've just done the same thing too often, or if they're being coached by someone like myself, maybe we're giving them the wrong type of training and it's just becoming boring. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, so there's that, I guess the off season is a key time for anyone that trains, but when your season ends, there's sometimes a little bit of depression sets in because you don't know what to do. <laughs> and so that is the perfect time to wonder, you know, am I enjoying it and what can I do now to have fun? And it is that just getting out and hiking while I'm not running so much and just enjoying the, you know, nature and, and whatever, or maybe, calling your friends or family and doing some mm. joint expedition. So, yeah, so I think that's kind of where it came from is maybe meeting people and, and even working with people that have lost that enthusiasm and, and yeah, but are still trying to tap away at the performance and not, not achieving or not succeeding. So. Yeah. I, I saw a conversation recently on a, on a forum talking about, um, She's like kind of changing as you age. The answer to the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, yeah. And, you know, so we as kids often say, like, I want to be an astronaut or I want to be an artist or like all of these things. And I think somebody came up their, their their suggestion to like what the answer to this question should be was a little bit pithy. And they said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they said, well, I want to be happy when I grow up. Yeah, it wasn't so much like which I which is which is what we're after, right? When we say, oh, I want to be an artist or I want to be a professor or whatever it is that I want to be, yeah. you just want to be happy, right? Like that's what you're yeah. actually after. Yeah. So that, that kind of reminds me of that where it's like, yeah, you may be after a podium spot, but like, don't you want to be enjoying yourself? Yeah. Yeah, would you enjoy the podium more if you enjoyed the journey to get there? And, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing I think about is like you you mentioned um, – athletes getting bored whether they had you know done too much of the same thing themselves or whether um one thing i think about with boredom i think we often like misattribute what boredom is 
Mm-hmm. And at least for me, I find boredom, if we dig down, is actually a kind of anxiety. Or it's like, mm-hmm. you know, you're bored, but like, I almost, I think we prescribe boredom as the state of a lack, like a, a, a lack of input or a lack of stimulus. Whereas I think it's almost too much internal stimulus. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where it's like, it's, it's this, this itch inside your head. that's like, do something different, move, stop yeah. being still or whatever. Um, do you like, do you find the same thing? in those people that you see they're like doing the same thing too often yeah the, some of the the anecdotes i'm thinking of that that's part of the issue i think and and but but it's on an individual basis and, and right. again when it comes to coaching it's more you know you kind of throw the means of the population out the window and you're just <laughs> right. on an individual basis but some people also love that boredom approach and and uh-huh. you know one one athlete I work with at the moment just loves that like routine, like wants to see the same session every yeah. week and, and doesn't want to be confused by something new and 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 that's kind of interesting. Like to me personally, that would be the most boring way I could ever train myself. Yeah. But for them, it works pretty well. And so, yeah. So it's a little nuanced, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so these. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are, you know, I don't know anyone here, but I'm sure there are probably Olympians that have stood on that podium with a gold medal and they're not entirely happy. <laughs> yeah. You know, for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Just the, the battle, was it worth it? You start evaluating this was so hard to achieve. What was, you know, was it worth it? And so, was it, right. And yeah, I think that whether you're an Olympian or not, I think that comes down to, the question for a lot of people, at least it's, at some point or another, whether you're beginning or you've been doing it for years, is you yeah. know, is it is it worth it? And I guess yeah. maybe that's maybe that's a good question for you as far as like since you've stepped away from from OCR, I assume it's to focus more on coaching now and kind of giving your athletes priority. You yeah. Know, um, what what, what, yeah. what was that change like? When did it not become as quite as worth it for you? Yeah, I think um, like a couple of reasons. I, I'd, I'd made quite a big change in life last year. I mean, we 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 left where we were living, and mm-hmm. my wife and I both quit our jobs to go and find somewhere to live in the mountains. So there was a big change going on in our life. Okay. And and like I said earlier, like the, the stimulus to compete, I'd done it for so long, there was no longer that burning desire to like look through the race calendars and you know what can I win? What can I try and achieve? It, it kind of, yeah, it kind of blunted a bit. And at the same time, it, it's nice also to step back and, and like you say, focus on coaching and, and focus on, okay, I've, I've gained all the experience I can in the racing environment. Um, I've raced at the top level in that sport. I, I don't need to do that anymore to inform my judgments for coaching. Mm-hmm. So if I step away from that and still do the occasional event or at least go to some events um, to learn how it's developing, then then that's good. And, you know, and, and, and things like, I mean, outside the obstacle racing scene, trail races, mountain races, road races, you can almost step out your door any weekend <laughs> and find one to do. Mm-hmm. And just to, you know, just to release some kind of, uh, yeah, <laughs> some energy. But um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, a combination of factors, yeah, probably uh, just time for a change. And I, I just don't have that drive to, to compete anymore. And yeah, and, and a, a bit of honesty as well, I suppose, is that, you you know, we all know what we're capable of. And, and mm-hmm. you get to that point where you know you've probably achieved all you can athletically. And, and you know, there's nothing more to come. So just ease off. <laughs> there's no need to stress yourself so much anymore. Just <laughs> focus on the nicer things in life that aren't sport related and, and, and so on. So th- there's a little bit of that for me personally. But, uh, yeah. 